Holy Spirit has led the church to. In, again, in Nobel, Nobel Millennium. Oh, no, wait a second. Uh, there are a few loose ends for the last talk. Good loose ends that I really do want to share. You know, somebody could hear what I said in the last talk about the broad way and the narrow way and say, hey, Ralph. Haven't you heard that it's possible for people to be saved without hearing the gospel? Why don't you take kind of a, a narrow view of things? Well, I have heard that. Have you heard the whole story about that? I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. The Catholic Church actually has a very clear teaching about the possibility of being saved without hearing the gospel. But you really need to know exactly what's being taught. And this is from section 16 of the Constitution on the Church from the Second Vatican Council. This is what it says. Those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but who nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace, try in their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, these too may achieve eternal salvation. So what the church is saying is that under certain specific conditions, there's the possibility that somebody could be saved. What are the conditions? That it's not their own fault that they don't know the gospel, in, in culpable ignorance of the gospel. Second condition is they're seeking God and want to know him. They're, they're striving to know God. You know, Romans chapter 1 says, every human being can know something of God by looking at the universe. You know, hey, there's, there's a God behind all this. And if you want to know who that God is and are trying to seek him and know him, that's, that's the second condition. Third condition is that assisted by grace, they're trying to live according to the light of their conscience. As Romans chapter 2 says, everybody's been given some light from God, some instinct of right and wrong. Deep down, every human being knows that stealing is wrong even though they steal. Deep down, every human being knows that adultery is wrong even though they commit adultery. There's something fundamental in human nature that knows this. And so if people are trying to live according to what they deep down know, assisted by the grace of God, if they're sincerely trying to know God, and if they're inculpably ignorant of the gospel, it's possible that they could come in contact with the saving grace of Christ. But the last three sentences, people never read, and I did a 330-page doctoral dissertation on these last three sentences. <laughs> but I'm going to give you the two-minute version. This is what the last three sentences say. But, very often, deceived by the evil one, human beings have become foolish in their thinking and have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. Or else... Living and dying in this world without God, they're exposed to ultimate despair. So many people are out of despair, out of desperation, or turning to drugs, or alcohol, or sex, or money, or whatever, or power, or domination, or hatred. Therefore, to procure the glory of God and the salvation of all these, whose salvation are we concerned about? people who had the theoretical possibility of coming into contact with the saving grace of Christ who don't. But as a matter of fact, aren't striving to know God. Aren't living according to the light of their conscience. Perhaps aren't even culpably ignorant of the gospel. I've had the experience sometimes of wanting to share the gospel with somebody and somebody saying no because they know what they're going to hear. You know, there's deep decisions of the human heart that a lot of times we're not fully in touch with. So it says, therefore, to procure the glory of God and the salvation of all these, the church, mindful of the Lord's command to preach the gospel to every creature, is zealous to carry out its mission of evangelization. So yes, there is a theoretical possibility, and I, I suspect some people do sincerely seek God and do live in accord with their light of their conscience and are coming in contact with the saving grace of Christ, even though they don't know his name. But very often this is not the case. So we really need to give people a chance to hear the good news, to, to call them to faith, to call them to repentance, to call them to baptism, to call them to the church. And this isn't just something that's relevant to unbelievers. This is something that's very relevant to Catholics. In the same church document, the Constitution of the Church, section 14, this is what it says about us Catholics. Remember all the times in Scripture 
people say, hey, hey, Jesus, we hung out with you, and Jesus said, I, I don't know you. Or he said, you know, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of God. You know, a lot of times people think, well, Vatican II changed all that, you know? Everybody's going to be saved now. Everybody, you know, God, you know, people are good, God's so good, you know, whatever. But this is what the church teaches in Vatican II. It says, he is not saved, however, who, though part of the body of the church, does not persevere in grace. He remains indeed in the bosom of the church, but as it were, only in a bodily manner, and not in his heart. All the church's children should remember that their exalted status is to be attributed not to their own merits, but to the special grace of Christ. It reminds you of the prophet Jeremiah, in, in the prophet Jeremiah's day, people are saying, hey, we got the temple, we got the temple, we got the temple. And Jeremiah says, you got the temple, you don't got the Lord. <laughs> You know, we're a Catholic, we're a Catholic, I'm a Catholic, you know, I'm, 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 I'm Irish, you know, I'm German, I'm Italian, I'm a Catholic, you know, I'm Hispanic. Well, as my dad used to say, that 50 cents would get you on the subway. No. I, I mean, you need more than the name, you need the reality, that's what the council is teaching here. What it says is that if the church's children fail, moreover, to respond to that grace of being a Catholic, in thought, word, and deed, not only shall they not be saved, but they'll be the more severely judged. So we have a tremendous responsibility to not receive the grace of God in vain. We have a tremendous responsibility not to receive the treasure of being a Catholic in vain. We need to have a tremendous responsibility to live in deep gratitude and great, great loyalty to the sacrifice of Christ that's given to us in, in, in the church. Okay, well that was the loose end from last talk. It's a pretty significant loose end. I'm glad I remembered. I'm glad I had a chance to give three talks. Here's the third talk now. And whatever loose ends are going to be left here, we're just going to have to wait for another day. Here's what the Pope said in that Novo Millennium Leonte. He says, even in countries evangelized many centuries ago, the reality of a Christian society is now gone. Today we must courageously face a situation which is becoming increasingly diversified and demanding. Over the years, I have often repeated the summons to the new evangelization. I do so again now, especially in order to insist that we must rekindle in ourselves the impetus of the beginnings and allow ourselves to be filled with the ardor of the apostolic preaching which followed Pentecost. We must revive in ourselves the burning conviction of Paul who cried out, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. So we're entering into a new situation where we're again becoming a persecuted minority surrounded by an aggressive pagan culture. And we need to rediscover some of the secrets of the early church that will now enable them not only to survive but to thrive and to evangelize. What are some of those secrets? One of those secrets is the gospel, the gospel truth. Another secret here is the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of Pentecost that enabled the apostles to go forward with confidence and boldness. He goes on to say, this passion will not fail to stir in the church a new sense of mission which cannot be left to a group of specialists but must involve the responsibility of all the members of the people of God. Everybody. Nobody here is too young or too old or too infirm or too dumb or anything to not participate in the mission of Christ. Just like there's a universal call to holiness, there's a universal call to participate in the mission of Christ. It's part of who we are now because we're a Christian. Now, leadership in the church. The purpose of leadership in the church is not to do the whole work of the church. Ephesians chapter 4 says, the risen Christ gave leadership gifts to the church apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists not to do the whole work for the church but to equip the saints who the heck are the saints you <laughs> yes you how could that be you say I mean I didn't pray today well you're not canonized saints but you're made you're made holy by baptism Jesus has taken a hold of you the Holy One is living in you despite your weakness and faults and sins. You are the Holy Ones. You are the saints. So the purpose of leadership in the church is to equip the saints, us, 
for the work of mission, for the work of ministry. So the leadership isn't to do the whole work of the church. And sometimes leadership thinks it's all on them. And when they hear about the new evangelization, they say, oh no, another thing I gotta do. No, what they have to do is everything that they're doing, but with a new optic, they have to recognize that sacramental preparation now has to have an evangelization component. Because people coming for the sacraments, a lot of times you can't presume, know who Jesus Christ is or know what it means to live as a disciple of Christ. People coming for marriage need to be told more about where to stand during a ceremony or take the compatibility survey about whether they're compatible or not on different things. They need to know that Jesus Christ is the center of Christian marriage. They need to know that they need to have a relationship with them. Same with, with confirmation. Just because you're in the eighth grade or whatever grade they confirm people here doesn't mean the whole class is ready for confirmation. And, and a lot of times you can't receive the effective graces of the sacrament and, and actualize them uh, unless you really desire them. And a lot of people are receiving sacraments that they don't understand what's being given to them. They don't desire it. And is it effective? It, it's there. It's given. Ex opere operato. But for it to blossom, it requires some desire, some knowledge, some understanding. So sacramental preparation now needs to have an evangelization component in, in every single sacrament, every single area. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm drifting off a little bit here. Okay. The Pope goes on to say, those who have come into genuine contact with Christ cannot keep him for themselves. They must proclaim him. Now, us Catholics are famous throughout the world for keeping Christ to ourselves. That's one of the marks of the Catholic Church. <laughs> now, this raises an embarrassing question. John Paul II says, those who have come into genuine contact with Christ can't keep it for themselves. So maybe, maybe evangelization needs to start within our ranks. And that's one of the things that the church is calling for with new evangelization. Maybe a lot of Catholics need to be invited to and know that it's possible to have a more dynamic, personal relationship with Christ. And then it says a new apostolic outreach is needed, which will be lived as the everyday commitment of Christian communities and groups. So we're not just talking about having special evangelization events, although those are really good to have. And we're not even necessarily talking about starting evangelization committees in our parishes and diocese, although those are good things to have. The danger, though, with evangelization committees is people are going to say, oh yeah, our parish has one of those. Yeah, 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 the evangelization committee is evangelizing. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> the purpose of evangelization committees is to equip the whole parish for the work of evangelization. The purpose of diocesan evangelization committees is to help the whole diocese come alive to who they are in Christ and their call to mission. And we're not talking about a, a once in a while thing, but we're talking about a new way of looking about who we are in our identity. We're on mission. Jesus is always in us looking to reach out to seek and to save those who are lost. This is something that's just there as part of our identity. It's not just a special every now and then thing, but it's Jesus is in us, praying, suffering, loving, looking to reach out through us for people to be reconciled to God. Okay. Now, ever since the beginning of the Second Vatican Council, the popes have been calling out for a new Pentecost. And the secret for Catholics getting excited about Jesus is first of all knowing who he is, and second of all being filled with the Holy Spirit in such a way that they really want to share other people with them. John, Pope John the Twenty-Third, blessed Pope John the Twenty-Third, when he called for a Second Vatican Council, had a prayer for all the Catholics to pray: "Lord, renew in your day, in this our day, uh, your signs and wonders, as by a new Pentecost." So John the Twenty-Third was looking not just for new documents; he was looking for a new action of God in the lives of Catholic people. He was looking for a new Pentecost. Pope Paul the Sixth. His successor said in one of his famous documents, in our day, what has happened to that hidden energy of the good news, which is able to have a powerful effect on man's conscience? And then he said, it must be said that the Holy Spirit is the principal agent of evangelization. It is he who impels each individual to proclaim the gospel, and it is, it is he who in the depths of consciences 
causes the word of salvation to be accepted and understood. But it can equally be said that he's the goal of evangelization. So the Holy Spirit works in the evangelizer, works in us, moving us to speak God's word or share our testimony. You know, sometimes we're around the water cooler at work, you know, or whatever we got now at work. You know, we still have water coolers. Or do we have virtual water coolers? I don't know. Uh, and, and, and somebody says, you know, isn't our boss crazy? And we say, yeah, 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 I, I, yeah, he, he is. Um, and then, then our friend says, you know, you, this used to freak you out a lot more than it does right now. Like, you used to really be the first one to complain about the boss. What's, what's, this, you know, you seem more peaceful now. What's going on? Well, rather than telling them that you're now on Valium, <laughs> tell them the truth, which hopefully would go something like this. Well, you know, I made a retreat a while ago, and it really brought me into deeper contact with the Lord. My faith has become more real, and I've started to pray and read the scripture. I just, I'm looking at things differently. I mean, I, I know there's more going on here than just the problems of this world, and I have a greater trust in the Lord. It's bringing more peace in my life. How about you? <laughs> anyway so the Holy Spirit inspires the evangelizer the Holy Spirit is also working in the heart of the person we're speaking to and the Holy Spirit is the goal of evangelizing we're trying to get the other person to get the Holy Spirit too so they become an evangelizer so that's the whole kind of chain there then he goes on to say we live in the church at a privileged moment of the Spirit Everywhere people are trying to know him better as the scripture reveals him. They are happy to place themselves under his inspiration. They are gathering about him. They want to let themselves be led by him. It's not by chance that the great inauguration of evangelization took place on the morning of Pentecost under the inspiration of the Spirit. One more quote from Paul 6. He says, More than once we've asked ourselves what the greatest deeds of the church are. What is the primary and ultimate need of our beloved and holy church? We must say it with holy fear, because as you know, this concerns the mystery of the church, her life. This need is the spirit. The church needs her eternal Pentecost. She needs fire in her heart, words on her lips, and a glance that is prophetic. You know, one of the greatest faux pas you can make in many church circles these days is getting excited about Jesus. I mean, what an unsophisticated person they're excited about Jesus. <laughs> Haven't they read enough theology? They wouldn't be so excited about Jesus if they read more theology. <laughs> sad, 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 but true. So we really need a new Pentecost to break through the false sophistication, the false complexifications, the the, the strange kind of ways in which we want to be loved by the world and accepted by a cynical culture. Not wanting to appear less sophisticated than unbelievers. Sad. There's also a, a line in scripture that says, he who is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. If you want to be loved by the world, you're going to find yourself compromising the gospel. And the church is just beginning to deal with wanting to be loved by the world. The church is just beginning to wake up to the fact that wanting to be loved by the world has gotten us into a weakened condition. We've been silent on things we shouldn't have been silent about. We've let ourselves be pressed into only talking about those things that the world wants us to talk about. But we've got to start talking about some other things that the world doesn't want to talk about, but it's the world's salvation. John Paul II. Well, you already know he's He's calling for a new Pentecost. He uses the language of new Pentecost. He spoke about it for, what, 28 years. He quotes Vatican II, Constitution of Church, section 12, where it says the Holy Spirit doesn't work just through the sacraments and ordained ministry, but he also distributes gifts as he wills to every single baptized person. This is kind of, did you know that? The Holy Spirit, it says, gives gifts. It's a quote to 1 Corinthians 12. The Holy Spirit distributes gifts to each one according as he wishes. All of us not only have natural gifts, but we also have the working of the Holy Spirit in us, sometimes building on those natural gifts and sometimes not. 
making what we're doing in our service fruitful, making our words alive, making our love genuine, making our desire to serve real. And there's so many different lists of the gifts in, in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about some of the more you know, kind of controversial, sensational ones like speaking in tongues and prophecy and healing. There's another list in Romans chapter 12 that talks about uh, giving money generously, administering, teaching, serving, helping. Uh, there's another list in 1 Peter chapter 4. So none of these lists are supposed to be exhaustive. And I, I might just put a word in here too, you know, I've, I've had a role in the Catholic Charismatic Renewal over the years, but I'm not here to promote the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. I'm here to point to the reality of Pentecost and the reality of the gifts of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit can't possibly be the property of a particular movement in the church. They belong to the whole church. Cardinal Soonan, one of the presidents of the Second Vatican Council, used to say, the purpose of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal is to be a witness in the church to what belongs to the whole church. And once the church wakes up to what, belong, what belongs to it, there's no need for a particular movement. And so the church is wakening up to the work of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit as, as essential for the new evangelization. Pope Benedict XVI. This is where a clip on would help, but we're doing pretty good with that. Pope Benedict XVI has called for a renewed Pentecost. He's recalled for, quote, a culture of Pentecost to be established in the church. You know what a culture of Pentecost would look like? It's a culture and fabric of relationships and how we relate to each other, how we greet each other, which builds one another up in the faith. You know, in Ephesians, somewhere in Ephesians, it says, I'm not as good, I'm not as, good as the Protestants on this. <laughs> It's a sign that I'm truly a Catholic. I can get to the book, but not to the verse. It says, sing songs to each other, admonish each other, build each other up, comfort each other. It's about a relational Christianity that isn't just based on talking about football games and bridge clubs, but it's based on our common joy of having Jesus as our Savior together, living in the Holy Spirit together, and carrying out mission together. A culture of our relationships where Christ is in them and we're speaking of, of him to one another and encouraging one another in the faith. I'm skipping lots of pages because I need to. <laughs> when Pope Benedict XVI arrived in the United States, he strongly called for, quote, a new outpouring of the Spirit. In St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, he said, let us implore from God the grace of a new Pentecost for the church in America. May tongues of fire, combining burning love of God and neighbor with zeal for the spread of Christ's kingdom, descend on all present. <laughs> Thanks be to God. <laughs> Let us pray. Oh God, with joy we turn our hearts. something more than that. Let us implore from God the grace of a new Pentecost for the church in America. Make tongues of fire combining burning love of God and neighbor. That's what we've been talking about all day today. With zeal for the spirit of Christ's kingdom. Descend on all present. specific about what a new Pentecost would look like and what it is and how you get it? We can. Let's take a look at the first Pentecost to see what the new Pentecost might be all about. What do we see about the first Pentecost? Well, Pentecost is the day on which the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened. It's 50 days after Passover. That's what, that's what it means. It was also a Jewish feast celebrating two things. One, the first fruits of the harvest, and secondly, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Thomas Aquinas says, the law of the new covenant is the Holy Spirit. 
So it was very symbolic that the Holy Spirit fell on the Feast of, the feast of Pentecost was celebrating the first giving of the law of God on tablets of stone. And now the Holy Spirit was being given into the hearts of believers to impel them towards holiness, to impel them towards union with God. Jesus described this outpouring of the Holy Spirit as being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's the language Jesus used to describe about it. It's also the language that John the Baptist used to describe the mission of Jesus. In each of the four Gospels, John the Baptist introduces Jesus as the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit, the one who will plunge you in the Holy Spirit, the one who will pour out the Holy Spirit on you. So the ultimate mission of Jesus through his death and resurrection and ascension is to pour out the Holy Spirit to fulfill all the Old Testament prophecies about each person knowing the Lord and not having to tell your neighbor anymore to know the Lord and having a new heart. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. John says, I am baptizing you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So already, the mission of Jesus is going to divide. Not because he wants it to divide, but because it will divide, because of human freedom. Remember the prophecy that Simeon prophesied about Jesus to Mary and Joseph? He will be a sign of contradiction. He will be the cause for both the rise and the fall for many in Israel. He will reveal the secrets of hearts. The, the theme of the two ways and the two decisions and the two destinations is not just isolated text. It's a fundamental theme of the entire scripture. The Lord put before the first human beings a choice. Moses put before his people before he left them a choice. This way is life, this way is death. Choose life. Jesus frequently spoke about it. He said, I haven't come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. And it's going to be division even within families. Not because he wants there to be division before, between families, but the human heart is free. And he foresaw that some were going to say no. Right here, there's going to be a gathering into his barn of those who receive his cleansing mercy, those who are cleansed by the Holy Spirit, and there's going to be a judgment by fire for those who reject. Okay, let's jump over now to the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 1. He presented himself alive to them by many proofs after he had suffered, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While meeting with them, he enjoined them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for, quote, the promise of the Father about which you have heard me speak. This is Jesus' words. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then they said, well, are you going to throw out the Romans now? <laughs> That's what he said. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus said, just pay attention right now. Don't get into end time speculation. Just do what I'm telling you. Wait in the city until you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, how did they receive the Holy Spirit at the first Pentecost? How can we renew our own baptism and confirmation today? How can a new Pentecost unfold in the hearts of Catholics? The same way it happened. What happened? They heard the word of God about the Holy Spirit. They, in some measure, believed without fully understanding. They obeyed the word of God, which is stay and wait for the Holy Spirit. They prayed for the fulfillment of the promise of the word that they had heard. And then the Holy Spirit came to them. That's how millions and millions of our fellow Catholics are experiencing a renewal in the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. I'm most familiar about it happening in Curcio movement and in Catholic Charismatic Renewal, but it happens through Ignatian retreats and other movements as well. Christ renews his parish, sometimes more intensely, sometimes less intensely. But the way they receive the Holy Spirit is the same way anybody's going to receive or renew or stir up the graces of the sacraments that they receive through believing, by hearing the Word of God. People need to be taught about the Holy Spirit. 
They need to be taught about how much the Holy Spirit wants to do for them. They need to be taught about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They need to be taught about how essential the Holy Spirit is to the whole Christian life. And they need to respond with faith. And they need to let hunger for God grow in their heart. And hunger for the Holy Spirit grow in their heart. And they need to pray for it. And of course it helps to do this with other people. It helps to receive guidance and leadership by people who know how to help other people do this. And many, many people have been helped by the Life of the Spirit seminars that the Catholic Charismatic Renewal provides. And if they have those in your parish, take advantage of them. You don't have to join any movement. Get the Holy Spirit and run. You go to a Catholic Charismatic Conference, you know, get the Holy Spirit and run. You may not want to run after you receive the Holy Spirit, but you can if you want to. The same with Curcio, same with Ignatian Retreats. I mean, do everything you can to get more of God in your life. Do everything you can to put a priority on seeking God, desiring more of God. Okay, we know it happened. The Holy Spirit fell on them. Peter got up and said, no, 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 we're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's what he said. That's the first papal encyclical. <laughs> that's, that's the first papal proclamation. They were excited about Jesus. So excited about Jesus, people said they must be drinking. Paul says later on in Ephesians, don't get drunk on wine, but be inebriated in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, in the remaining seven minutes, I'm going to try to set an example of obedience. Through the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years of the life of the early church, we're going to see a continuing concern on the part of the apostles that each new group of converts that come to believe in Christ also receive the gift of the Spirit. Acts chapter 8. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, and that was a bit of a shock, you know, Samaritans weren't supposed to qualify for God's grace, they sent up Peter and John, who went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet fallen upon any of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, you know, you can't be a Christian without the Holy Spirit, so they had something of the Holy Spirit, but it hadn't fallen on them. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon the magician saw that the Spirit was conferred by the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the money and said, how much would it cost for me to be able to do that? He said, give me this power too, so that anyone upon whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't have a lot of magicians following around our bishops at confirmation, do we? <laughs> we don't. Something's supposed to happen at confirmation. Gifts are supposed to be given. People are supposed to be activated for witness and, and, and evangelization. You know, the, the Catholic theology of confirmation is that it's an adult affirmation. It's a, it's a further decision to follow Jesus and to be a witness for him. When I talk to youth ministers and DREs across the country, they tell me that too often confirmation is seen as the last thing they have to do, and they check it off their list, and they don't even come to church anymore. They were being dropped off for confirmation class by parents who weren't going to church. And so rather than becoming something that deepens their commitment to Christ, it becomes something they just go through the motions on. Sometimes they don't understand it, they don't want it, they don't pay attention to what it is, and, and we just kind of march them through. That's why we have such a weak church. One of the reasons. Acts chapter 10. Peter has a vision. And the Lord tells him to go to the Gentiles. And Peter says, I can't do that, Lord. That's against my religion. <laughs> well, he says, he says, I'm a good Jew. I can't do that. And, and the Lord says, come on. I'm going to broaden your horizons about what I'm doing with all this. This isn't just for the Jews. This is for everybody. So it goes to Cornelius' household. And it says, while Peter was still speaking these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to his word. The Jewish believers who had accompanied Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit should have been poured out on the Gentiles, for they could hear them speaking in tongues of glorifying God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit, even as we have? So what happened at the first Pentecost wasn't supposed to be a one-time event to get the church launched, you know, and then now we can handle it by ourselves, Lord, thank you. 
It wasn't just supposed to be for the apostles. You see continually in the Acts of the Apostles a concern that every new group of converts that the Acts of the Apostles tells us about there's a concern that they come into the same experience of Pentecost as the apostles did with the same results. Sometimes it talks about this charismatic gift, sometimes it talks about that, but some manifestation of the Spirit. So Peter's saying, hey, it didn't happen in the right order. They're supposed to be baptized first and then receive the Holy Spirit, but God must be doing something. We better get on board with it. Now, Peter gets in trouble for doing this. Peter gets in trouble back at headquarters. He goes back to religious headquarters, and they say, Peter, you did what? You baptized Gentiles? What the heck is going on here? Peter says, the Holy Spirit made me do it. <laughs> he says, he says as I, this is Acts chapter 11, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord. Remember what Jesus said in John's Gospel? The Holy Spirit will remind you of what I've said. The Holy Spirit will give you light to understand what's happening. He'll do all kinds of wonderful things to the Holy Spirit. But here we see what Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would do. He does for Peter. Peter remembered the words of the Lord that would explain what just happened. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift he gave to us, but we came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to be able to hinder God? When they heard this, they stopped objecting and glorified God, saying, God has then granted life giving repentance to the Gentiles too. Okay, one more, Acts chapter 19. Paul comes across some disciples at Ephesus, and he's trying to figure out where they are in the Christian journey. And he says, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? And they said, we haven't even heard about the Holy Spirit. Bad adult catechesis. <laughs> Big gaps, you know, in their catechesis, you know. So Paul fills in the blanks, tells them about Jesus, tells them about the Holy Spirit. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul laid his hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. And we see ongoing refillings with the Spirit, renewals of the Spirit, persecutions coming. They pray, Lord, send your Spirit again and give us boldness while you reach out your hand and do signs and wonders. And that's what enabled them to keep on preaching and teaching even when they were threatened with prison and death with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the apostles had the best Bible study anybody ever had before Pentecost. Jesus taught them the Bible. Jesus taught them the Bible after his resurrection. They had the best spiritual direction anybody ever had. They had the best pastoral supervision anybody had. You know, do it this way, come back, I'll give you some feedback. They had th the best training anybody ever had. No one ran away at the cross, right? They locked the door before Pentecost. What made the difference? What made the difference was the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came to them, it all came together. And I told you how it just all came together for me in a certain way when I was reading John of the Cross 30 years after I first started reading it. It all came together because of the Holy Spirit. They say, I get it now. What they had known in their head went to their heart and their spirit. It all came alive. All the teaching was valuable, but it needed to be inflamed by the Holy Spirit. So, orthodoxy is not enough. Fidelity to the magisterium is not enough. It's absolutely essential, it's absolutely important. We're in terrible shape because there hasn't been right teaching and right preaching and right believing. But it's not enough. It's that wholehearted surrender to the Lord. It's that wholehearted personal relationship. It's that wholehearted crying out to God for the waters, the living waters of the Holy Spirit. It's that unembarrassed, Unashamed, getting over our false, sophisticated <laughs> inhibitions and saying, I don't care what people think. I love Jesus Christ. I don't care what people think. I believe Jesus Christ. Call me what you will. I love Jesus Christ. Amen.